uh, moving on to my contribution, uh, since I've already been introduced uh, so very nicely by Gleaves Whitney, let me simply say that uh, the title of the paper is Lessons from Late Antiquity for the Obama Administration. In his novel entitled Saturday, published in 2005, author Ian McEwen immerses his reader in the private reveries of his protagonist, a London neurosurgeon named Henry Perrone. Perrone is a successful and capable professional and a self-described habitual observer of his own moods. In spite of the personal stability and comfort he enjoys, Perrone cannot elude a gnawing sense of foreboding. The causes of his unease include the 9-11 terror attacks and the invasion of Iraq, which is looming at the time at which the action of the story takes place on the 15th of February 2003, the eponymous Saturday of the title. The novel thematizes the anxieties besetting urbane and articulate denizens of the early 21st century West, anxieties that the global financial crisis has more recently exacerbated and that the Obama administration must address as it strives to realize its mandate for change. In the arresting opening sequence of McEwen's novel, Perrone looks out of his fashionable townhouse into the early morning darkness <coughs> and cannot help but wonder whether an airliner he sees in the distance is about to be transformed into a weapon. Later that same day, while he is cleaning himself up at home following a game of squash, his consciousness takes him momentarily outside of himself and into a sardonic meditation on the end of civilizations. And here I quote from the novel. He, Perone, steps under the shower, a forceful cascade pumped down from the third floor. <coughs> when this civilization falls, when the Romans, whoever they are this time around, have finally left and the new dark ages begin, this will be one of the first luxuries to go. The old folk crouching by their peat fires will tell their disbelieving grandchildren of standing naked in midwinter under jet streams of hot, clean water of lozenges, of scented soaps, and of viscous amber and vermilion <clears throat> liquids. They rubbed into their hair to make it glossy and more voluminous than it really was. And of thick white towels as big as togas waiting on warming racks. This passage reminds me of a well-known letter written by a fifth century Roman aristocrat named Sidonius Apollinaris to his friend Denidius. In that letter, Sidonius uh, describes at some length a week-long holiday he enjoyed as the guest of some of his relatives at two adjoining country villas near the city of Nemausus, modern Nîmes, in southern Gaul, which of course today we know as France. Sidonius's visit took place at some point in the 460s AD, during the time when central Roman imperial authority over Gaul was receding, and even Italy itself would soon bid farewell to its last Western Roman emperor. Roman forces had already been withdrawn from Henry Perrone's Britain half a century, century earlier. Sidonius was the son and grandson of Roman prefects of Gaul and the son-in-law of an ineffective Western Roman emperor. <coughs> and Sidonius himself attained the high office of urban prefect of Rome in the title of patrician. It was a sign of the times, however, that Sidonius would make his mark upon history as a bishop of the city of Clermont-Ferrand in the Alvern in south-central France where he was consecrated in or about the year 470. It was there, besieged in that city, that Sidonius at first resisted and at length capitulated in 475 to the Visigoths. In spite of his resistance, Sidonius was eventually restored to his see and paid court to Visigothic kings in their capital at Toulouse down to his death at some point in the 480s, after which he was canonized as a Roman Catholic saint. His feast day is the 21st of August, in case you're wondering. Any sense of foreboding Sidonius might have had about his turbulent times is suppressed in his letter to Denidius, which studiously depicts the cultivated ease that for centuries had represented the acme of gracious living for Roman elites. Sidonius' hosts vie with one another in keeping him occupied with extravagant meals. The courtyards are abuzz with ball players and the rattling of dice. There is a well-stocked private library, which is organized so that the ladies of the household are relegated to a section devoted entirely to works of religious devotion, while the gentlemen have access to the classics of pagan Latin literature. Learned conversation at mid-morning is brought to a close with the announcement of the midday meal. There is the occasion for storytelling, as the guests linger over their wine. 
at last everyone trundles off to his quarters for the siesta. It doesn't sound half bad. Later in the afternoon, once Sidonius and the others have woken up, they all go off riding in the countryside in order to work up an appetite for supper. When they return, they're ready for a bath. But Sidonius tells Denidius that even though both of the estates had Roman bathhouses of their own, neither of them happened to be serviceable at the time. And here I quote from the letter. So, Sidonius tells Denidius, I set my own servants to work in the rare sober interludes at which the convivial bowl of wine, too often filled, allowed their sodden brains. I made them dig a pit at their best speed, either by a spring or by the river. Into this a heap of red-hot stones was thrown, and the glowing cavity then covered over with an arched roof of wattled hazel." Unquote. Once this makeshift sweat lodge or sauna had been well insulated with a covering of heavy blankets and water had been sprinkled on the stones, Sidonius reports, quote, In these vapor baths we passed whole hours with lively talk and repartee. All the time, the cloud of hissing steam enveloping us induced the healthiest perspiration, unquote. Duly <coughs> schwitzed, the party completed their ablutions in the Roman fashion with plunges first into hot and then into cold baths of water. On the one hand, then, we have the fictional 21st century London neurosurgeon Henry Perrone. On the other hand, there is the 5th century Gallo-Roman aristocrat destined to become the canonized Catholic bishop Sidonius Apollinaris, who, it should be pointed out, is himself as he presents himself in his letters an artfully constructed persona. What you have the two of these men in my mind is not simply that both of them enjoy hot baths, but rather that the enjoyment of hot baths, which unites them, is itself not a simple thing when we regard it as a socioeconomic and cultural phenomenon. Whether in the private bathhouses of the ultra-rich or in the palatial bath complexes erected in Rome and other great cities by emperors from the first to the fourth centuries, or in the modest bathing structures incorporated into frontier settlements, bathing was a hallmark of Roman civilization. The Roman historian Tacitus links bathing to Roman civilization with a mordantly cynical twist when he describes the efforts made by his father-in-law, Gnaeus Julius Agricola, in the first century AD, to pacify the inhabitants of the recently conquered and organized Roman province of Britannia, what would become in part the Britain of Henry Perron. Tacitus tells us that Agricola encouraged the building of temples and fora and houses. He co-opted the sons of indigenous elites by training them in the liberal arts. He encouraged the use of Latin and the wearing of Roman dress. Quote, and gradually they, the Britons, gave in to the attractions of vices, of porticos and baths, and the elegance of banquets. And this was called civilization among those who did not know better, although it was part of slavery. Unquote. Tacitus appreciated the role of acculturation and assimilation, the gradual diffusion of Roman soft power and cultural capital in extending and consolidating a Roman imperial order. Agricola's Britons were shaped and transformed by contact and interaction with that order and their exposure to Roman luxuries, to use the word Henry Perrone uses to describe his own hot shower. Yet Sidonius's determination to enjoy a proper Roman bath might seem to be a trivial thing, and worse still, an idle indulgence on the part of the representative of a pampered elite who is seemingly oblivious to the world that is evidently collapsing all around him. We recognize in Henry Perrone's private interior monologue in his shower his sense of the absurdity of modern consumerism, with all of its scented and viscous personal grooming products and we share with him to one extent or another that distinctively modern self-consciousness which tempers one's enjoyment of life's comforts with the gnawing suspicion that one is living increasingly beyond one's means and at the expense of others who are less fortunate. If, on the other hand, Sidonius experienced anxiety or a sense of foreboding during his holiday, he is determined not to disclose it. Like many ancient letter collections, Sidonius's letters were carefully composed with many audiences in mind and subsequently gathered together and prepared for publication. His portraits of leisurely, aristocratic living deliberately mask a more complex and uncertain reality. Yet even if the style of gracious living in country villas that Sidonius evokes in his letter to Denidius was imperiled, it would not disappear overnight. <laughs> the various successor states in the post-Roman West had an interest in perpetuating the Roman provincial administration, and they had uses for men like Sidonius.